Hi, I'm Dad the Engineer. Today I'm going to cover internet connectivity options. At least some of you will find out you're paying too much for too little, and I'm happy to help you figure out if it's time to move on from what you have. Before I get to that, I'm going to ask you to like this video and subscribe to my channel. It would help me a lot, and I greatly appreciate the gesture. I made a video on internet connectivity options recently, and I was really surprised by the response. I only heard from a couple viewers, but they had more in-depth questions about a couple of the options, and they mentioned a couple connection types I'd omitted. From that, I realized it was probably important to cover options that, while available, are no longer suitable for use. I put the options from worst to first, with the obvious caveat that you may not have all of these options available to you at all. Dialogue. You might be surprised to find out that phone line based dial up internet access still exists. Not only that, but almost 400,000 people are still using it. As you'd expect, the number of dial up providers has dwindled down to about nothing, but you can still sign up with NetZero, AOL, Earthlink, and Juno. Some providers claim to have accelerated speeds, but they're just referring to their use of decontenting proxy servers. The actual maximum connection speed is still just 56 kilobits per second, and their accelerated services are all but obsolete, with almost all web traffic now employing end-to-end -end encryption. Dial-up service plans range from free to $12 a month. Considering that you also have to have a phone line, which generally starts around $70 a month now, this is no longer the cheap solution it once was. DSL and the rest of the telco options. Digital Subscriber Line, or DSL, has been around since the early days of broadband internet connectivity. The main reason it was able to enter the market so quickly was that it uses existing telephone wiring. This infrastructure advantage was somewhat blunted by the distance limitations of DSL from the central switching office. Ultimately, the limitations of this infrastructure doomed DSL to installation headaches, low speeds, and a constantly eroding market position. One of the interesting things about DSL is that plenty of people have it and don't even know it. Despite the head start, AT&T realized DSL wasn't a solution that would be able to compete with cable in the long term, in terms of performance or deployment, so it started large-scale fiber optic projects across the United States. That takes time. It also takes a lot of money. AT&T decided to capitalize on their efforts by creating the Uverse branding. It acts as an umbrella for both fiber, optic, and DSL internet access. Which will you get? Who knows? It depends on your service address. While informed consumers can deduce when they're being stuck with DSL, many consumers just assume they have fiber. You know, because it's Uverse. While it may fit the letter of the law, I still think it's a deceptive business practice. It's worth noting that there are different flavors of DSL, insofar as there are different flavors of poison. They may be different, but they're all bad. These days, the most common variants of DSL are VDSL2 and ADSL2+. Speeds are dramatically affected by distance and line quality, but user reporting puts typical speeds at around 18 megabit per second download and just over 1 megabit per second upload. Oof. At its cheapest, DSL costs about $60 a month, but that can rise drastically depending on the speed and data limits you select. Also, DSL can come in a bundle of other services, some of which you may not want. If you have fiber and cable available, I can't think of a good reason to have DSL. If you're looking at a bill that's $90 or more, it's time to switch to just about anything else, including cellular or satellite. There are other options offered over telephone wiring like T1, T3, lease lines, and ISDN. While I used to have ISDN to my apartment 25 years ago and T1s to my house 20 years ago, these are generally not residential connections. They're also increasingly rare commercially. High Orbit Satellite Satellite internet didn't start with SpaceX's Starlink, and rural homes and businesses have been using older satellite providers for about 30 years. In the U.S., there's been some consolidation in the market, but the old players in the U.S. are HughesNet and Viasat. Their satellites are geostationary, and those satellites sit at an altitude of about 22,000 miles. On the positive side, that gives you a single point in the sky to aim your dish at. It's also a good option if critical utilities are experiencing outages as long as you have power. Pretty much everything else is a negative though, as the extreme distances are responsible for massive latency. While the bandwidth is suitable for some tasks, it's not well suited for real-time two-way communication via voice or video like Zoom or Teams. It's also not very usable for networked gameplay. Like DSL, high orbit satellite service is still around, but it makes little sense given the alternatives. There are lower cost satellite plans, but I don't think it makes sense to use an option that has data caps. 
Viasat is making the most of their infrastructure, offering a $145 a month unlimited plan. The 86 megabit per second download and 4 megabit per second upload speeds aren't awful, but the 650 millisecond latency is. Considering SpaceX's Starlink is cheaper and faster, it's hard to see legacy satellite internet as a viable option. 4G Cellular Millions of Americans access the internet using 4G LTE cellular every day. Granted, that's using their smartphones, but it's also a viable option for residential access, too. It's probable that whatever you think about cellular internet speeds comes from using a device with a tiny antenna, but it doesn't have to be that way. Cellular modems can use permanently mounted, external high gain, and even directional antennas that provide strong service and high speeds, even in areas with relatively poor service. All of this makes cellular internet a great option when terrestrial alternatives aren't available. Typical real-world speeds seem to land around 80 megabit per second download and 3 megabit per second upload with decent, if uneven, latency. Cost and availability are two major attractions, and lots of plans are available, including capped and uncapped options. A backup plan, where a cellular connection is only meant for use when a primary internet connection is out, can be as cheap as $20 a month. Full unlimited plans can be as little as $50 a month. Low Orbit Satellite SpaceX's Starlink internet service is different than the high-orbit satellite internet services in that the satellites are over 21,000 miles closer to the Earth. There are also thousands of satellites in the constellation. These infrastructure choices make Starlink not only faster, but also give it latency that's much closer to terrestrial connections. Unlike other satellite internet providers, SpaceX regularly launches new satellites, so the bandwidth and capabilities can actually be improved over time. For example, the typical 250 megabit per second download and 20 megabit per second upload speeds may increase as the constellation grows and the backhaul technology improves. With service at $120 a month and residential hardware at $349 plus shipping and tax, Starlink isn't generally going to be the cheapest option. However, if you're in a remote area with limited connectivity options, satellite internet may be your only option at all. If you're in a situation where you have to pick amongst the satellite options, Starlink is by far the best choice. With better performance at a comparable cost, it's an easy decision. If you have your own reasons for not wanting to put money into SpaceX, there will eventually be other low-orbit satellite alternatives in the future like Amazon's Kuiper. 5G Cellular Everything good about 4G LTE cellular internet is even better when using 5G. This whole thing is kind of a gray area though, as 5G is a pretty large standard, with the lowest frequency performance tiers of 5G actually just being a rebrand of 4G LTE. Assuming you get to the upper frequency ranges of real 5G, you can get performance as high as 10 gigabit per second. Real world speeds depend on carrier and frequency band, but many subscribers have 200 plus megabit per second download and 30 megabit per second upload speeds in their coverage areas. Considering that 5G plans are available with pretty much the same options and price points as 4G, it really just comes down to availability. If you have access to 5G cellular, it can be a much more attractive option than satellite internet, and even some terrestrial options. As always, it also remains a great secondary option for backup internet, and the link to the video that shows you how that works is in the top right corner and in the video description below. Cable. Like DSL, cable internet connectivity was created to exploit existing infrastructure. At this point, cable TV has been around for over 70 years. While not quite as ubiquitous as telephone wiring for DSL, cable coax has considerably more bandwidth. When cable providers started discontinuing analog channels from their lineups, that opened up massive amounts of bandwidth to cable modem users. That, combined with lots of technological innovation and analog semiconductor design and DSPs, led to cheap consumer equipment that could use cable TV's infrastructure for truly next-generation connectivity speeds. Unlike AT&T, many cable providers updated their infrastructure in place. Several cable providers also elected to start major fiber optic projects, but many of them have done it, or are still doing it, in a way where the connection from the street to the house doesn't change. This approach can sometimes lead to nasty surprises, but usually makes for a less traumatic implementation for the consumer. The lack of uniformity in updating aging infrastructure means that there can be a pretty wide variety in cable internet speeds throughout the country. Where cable is available though, you can usually get packages of at least 400 megabit per second download and 20 megabit per second upload. Slower packages may be available for less money, but those speeds tend to be artificially governed. In some areas, cable is available in speeds of 5 gigabit per second or higher, where all or almost all of the network to your house is actually fiber. Fiber. Fiber optic networking has been around for over 50 years. 
It's a great way to move lots of data quickly and immune to many of the material, electrical, and magnetic problems associated with high frequency data transmission over metal wires. The problem has been the cost associated with putting fiber optic cabling in the ground all of the places where people are. Without the infrastructure advantages that cable and DSL had, it's taken over two decades for us to get to just under a third of all households having the option of an all fiber network connection. At the end of 2025, it's projected to be about half of all households. It doesn't take a genius to figure out that the rate of build-out is going to dramatically fall once the cost of reaching additional customers gets to a certain point. Really, that's the same reason that the deployment of all non-satellite connectivity reaches a deployment limit. There's some hope, though, as there are rural electrical companies that have decided to use their right-of-way to get into the internet connection business. If you happen to be one of those people that has access to a fiber optic internet connection, you should probably get it. Fiber optic internet connectivity is usually available in a spectrum of speeds at any particular service address, with the lower speeds usually just artificially governed to create multiple price points. Many people pay about $65 a month for one gigabit per second, while speeds 10 gigabit per second or higher are available in some areas. Fiber is more resilient than other terrestrial options, usually suffering fewer outages owing to its newer infrastructure. It's worth noting that if a construction crew didn't call 311 and takes out a fiber trunk, you're still screwed, and possibly for a while. Like I mentioned before, I have a good video on combining two or more internet connections at your router so you don't have any downtime, backhoe or not. The video link is at the top right and in the video description below. Somebody else's internet connection. The final internet connection type I'm going to cover is SEI. Depending on how you come about this one, it's either an honorable or dishonorable mention. SEI stands for someone else's internet. If you're in an apartment, you probably are close enough to use someone else's Wi-Fi. If you have a friend nearby, you can share a connection or two with a network bridge. I have a video about co-op internet connectivity in the top right and in the video description below. Free may sound good to you, but there are a couple things to keep in mind. First, the consumer terms of service agreement states that whomever is paying for the connection is not supposed to share it. Because of the way NAT works, it's not really feasible for the provider to figure this out. Second, it's illegal to connect to somebody else's network without their consent, even if they didn't enable authentication on their Wi-Fi network. Don't believe me? Check out the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, or CFAA. Regardless, I don't really like this option, as I think of it as a whole extra layer of opportunities for failure. It also has some inherent security problems, but hey, everyone's value and belief systems are different, so you may feel differently about second-hand or communal internet connectivity. The takeaways from this video are that, one, free dial-up is actually more expensive than some of the other better options on this list once you factor in the cost of the phone line. Two, if you have DSL, get rid of it. Lots of people were duped into DSL with AT&T's U-verse branding. If your U-verse isn't fiber, get something else. Three. High orbit satellite service through HughesNet or Viasat is probably not worth having anymore. Yes, your equipment may already be paid for, but the experience versus cellular or low orbit satellite is better to the point where amortizing the cost of new hardware is probably worth it. 4. 4G LTE internet can be quite good with the proper antenna. Speeds are okay and the cost can be extremely inexpensive. 5. Low orbit satellite or SpaceX's Starlink specifically is pretty fast and pretty expensive. It's excellent when no other options are available, and it's a great backup connection, as it's not going to be susceptible to the same types of events that can cause other connection types to have outages. 6. 5G cellular is just as good or better than 4G LTE, assuming it's available. Speeds range from good to great, and flexible plans let you pay to a performance level or a price. 7. Cable is a good performing option at a good price point. Wide availability make it the best value where fiber isn't an option. 8. Fiber optic internet provides top tier speed, often at the lowest price. Availability, especially outside of population centers and new construction, remains the weakest point. Where you can get it, this is usually the best option. I tried to think of a good way to comparatively present these options with speed, cost, availability, and reliability all called out. A radar plot, I thought. I realized it was a mistake when I saw it, as you are seeing it now. Look at it. Look at it. I realized it missed the point, as availability acts as a filter, not a comparative criteria. Beyond that, the weighting of the individual category shouldn't be equal, and categories that you don't care about should be omitted. Oh well. You have the list. Easy mode is to start at the top and keep going down the list until the option is available at your location. Obviously, this assumes that you're at a fixed location, and that there isn't a completely uncharacteristically bad quality about the service provider in question. 
If you get stuck, feel free to ask me questions in the comments. Also, while this video is specifically about the United States and the options available here, it's generally transferable to any locality. If you haven't seen it, I recommend you watch my video on if you need to throw your router away. After all, what good is a great internet connection if you're not adequately protected? If you found this video to be helpful and would like to see more like it, please like and subscribe. I'm just getting this thing started and I could really use your help. If you would like to contribute some feedback, please engage with me in the comments below. If, like me, you're a little old school, please check out my website linked in my bio. Thanks and have an awesome day.